when we're done with milestone two, we're done with the pair programming. We're into traditional solo task, summative lab, um, only being able to, to, to get tips from me, um, just, like, just like any other summative lab at this point. Um, so we're going to shift our focus away from the peace class. Um, I mean, we're going to keep using the peace class. It is the fundamental class in, the, in this game of Tetris. Um, but we're going to start focusing on the game of Tetris itself instead of just the, just the piece. So I want to like introduce you to a couple of classes and make it clear which ones you simply need to reference and which ones you'll be adding code to. So the board class is a really important class. Um, it basically does all the work to play Tetris or to model the actual game of Tetris um, in that it keeps track of like where the pieces are on the board um, and all the stuff about that, uh, that, that goes on. Um, it is already implemented. You do not need to implement anything in the board class. Um, it might be helpful to like read through it. Um, you might be curious, like how does it work to play Tetris? That's all cool, but you don't need to change any code in the board class. So please, please don't. If you're changing code in the board class, you're probably gonna break something. Um, it keeps track of the current state of the board. Um, it basically helps like in terms of pieces can like fall, detects like when they hit, all that type of stuff. Um, and it does it pretty quickly so that um, our brain can, can move pieces around while the game is being played. Um, basically just in terms of the model, you can think of the Tetris board as, as, as a 2D array. Um, it's a grid. Um, it's really just a 2D array of Booleans that store where there's a block, um, like where, where you know, part of a, a little pixel is. The lower left corner is zero, zero. Um, X increases to the right, Y increases upwards, same coordinate system we use for a piece. Um, where there is a little pixel, um, it has a value of true, otherwise it has a value of false. You don't need to worry about any of that. I just wanna share it with you so you understand like how it's, how it's modeled. Another class that you don't need to modify, but you do need to be very familiar with is the J Tetris class. So the board is part of the model in our model view controller. Um, the J Tetris class is like the is more like the view part. It's the part that displays the graphical user interface that you see when you play the game. Um, you do not need to change the J Tetris, but you will be subclassing it and you do need to be very familiar with some of its methods. So the provided J Tetris class, it's already written and it lets you play Tetris. In fact, once you finish Milestone 2, you can play Tetris, which is super cool. Um, so you use the keys 4, 5, and 6 if you have a number pad or and 0 to drop or J, K, and L, and N um, on, the, on the rest of your keyboard. Um, there's a speed slider that's already built in, so it's good to go. So once you finish Milestone 2, you can actually play Tetris. Um, the Tetris viewer class is, has a main method that makes everything run. Um, you're gonna make one very small change in that. Um, but it is important you really understand how JTetris works. So I wanna just give you a, a couple highlights here. You can refer to them later as you work through this because you're gonna subclass JTetris to basically let the brain play Tetris instead of you at the keyboard play Tetris. So here are the really important methods. Tick is a really important method. Tick is invoked every time the pieces are gonna drop down one row, okay? So every time tick is called, the pieces will drop down one row. They can also move left and right or, or be rotated. So tick is super important. Um, compute new position um, is used to figure out like where the piece is gonna go based on changing X, Y, and rotation, um, like one move from now, okay? So that's another method that you're going to want to definitely refer to. Um, tick also detects if a piece has landed. Okay, that's where we use the skirt. Okay, some part of the piece is resting on some other piece that's already at rest. That's when we know it can't go down anymore. Um, there's also this command line argument test. Um, and I just want to be clear about this. Later in the lab, when you get to milestone five, when you run the main method in Tetris Viewer, you'll set test to true or you'll set test mode to true, um, and it's gonna run the game with, this, with a special sequence of pieces. Um, in fact, the same sequence of pieces every time, 
And that's going to help you verify that everything works. We'll get to that in a second. So just be aware of that. So your subclass of J Tetris is going to add some new behaviors. It's also going to use the existing behavior. There's going to be lots of super stuff going on here because um, you don't want to rewrite anything in J Tetris. You just want to extend it. Okay. Um, there's already a brain interface. The brain interface defines this method best move, which says for the given state of the board in this piece, where's the best place to put it? What should its rotation be? Where should it be on the board? Um, that's what the interface has, right? I already wrote a simple brain, um, which is a really simple implementation. It works okay. Take a look at it. I think it's cool to see like it's not very complicated. Um, and you can look at it and be like, oh, this isn't so bad. This isn't very smart. Um, that's why it's a simple brain. Um, but basically it tries all possible moves, okay? So it's calling into the board class and says, all right, move the piece one to the left. Is that a good move? Okay, move the piece one to the left and rotate it. Is that a good move, right? So it's basically trying all the different combinations. Um, and there's this little, there's this method rate board, which decides like how good is the resulting board. And the logic is super simple. Like if there are more blocks in the board, that's bad because we want blocks to go away. Um, if there's holes, meaning spots that are surrounded by blocks, that's bad because it's hard to fill those in, right? That's pretty much like the logic. Um, but take a look at it just so, just so you can see it. You do not need to change the simple brain. There is an extension to write like a big brain class, um, but that's, that's just an extension. What you are going to write, though, is this brain factory class. Um, there's something called the factory design pattern. That's another one of these design patterns, like listeners and composites um, that we've talked about. The factory design pattern, you're going to create an array list. You're going to implement the create brain static method. It's going to simply return an array list where each element in the, where the first element in the array list refers to a new simple brain object. And the second element in the array list returns to a, refers to a small brain object. Um, the small brain class also implements brain, except being small brain, it makes the worst possible move. Okay, so it's it's actually the same. If you look at the implementation, it's the same as the simple brain, but instead of picking the best move, it picks the worst move, um, and it, it plays Tetris as poorly as possible. So. Um, it's fun to watch it though. All right. Um, so you're just going to, I mean, this brain factory method is pretty easy. You're going to create a new array list. You're going to put two elements in it. You're done. Um, if you do an extension and create a big brain, add that in too. Create a third element. All right. That's the first step for milestone three. The second step for milestone three focuses on the GUI stuff that we've learned throughout the, um, throughout this unit. Um, so you're going to create a J brain Tetris subclass of J Tetris. So we're doing inheritance here. Um, instead of letting the user play Tetris, um, if the brain is enabled, you'll let the brain play Tetris. Okay. A um, couple things I want to point out that are important. There are several instance variables in J Tetris that has the visibility of protected. Okay. We haven't seen protected before. We're used to public and private. Protected means subclasses can directly access those instance variables, and you will need to do so, and that's okay. Um, not the best design, I'll be honest. Um, I probably should clean this up and get rid of that, but that's what we've got right now. So in your JBrain Tetris subclass, you can, you can directly access the protected instance variables, and you will need to do so. I try to give you some support of what JBrain Tetris needs to do. First of all, you need to change the main method in JTetris Viewer. So you actually create an instance of JBrain Tetris instead of JTetris. So that's a one word change. Um, JBrain Tetris needs some instance variables. One of them is an instance variable of type brain, which refers to the currently selected brain. You need to know which brain is being used. The create control panel method is where most of your code is going to go. You're going to override it. You're going to still call the super classes implementation of it because that does most of the graphical user interface. It also returns a reference to the panel, which you're going to need to store in a local variable. 
because you have to add a bunch of other stuff to the panel. Not a bunch, a few things. You need to add a J combo box, okay? We've never done one of those before. There's a good tutorial here that talks you through it, okay? There's a lot of conversions between array lists and arrays. It's a little bit of a pain, but we've written code like that. Um, we've done that on a couple of quizzes now, or a couple effort practice FRQs. Um, J combo box is gonna need a listener, okay? Um, it's like the action listener interface we did for a button, right? So you'll need to do one of those inner classes for that. Um, you're also gonna create a button called enable brain, and you'll need to do another action listener for that. And when it's clicked, you're gonna change some instance variable, which you'll have to create to say, hey, the brain is enabled. Um, or the brain is disabled, whichever it happens to be, and then change the label. So after, if the button says enable brain and I click on it, you should set like the instance variable enable brain to true, and you should change the label to disable brain. Um, so I know what the button does when I click on it. So you're gonna add a J combo box, you're gonna add a J button. Once you do those and hook it all up and run it, your thing's gonna look just like this. All of this stuff is already created for you, Here's the combo box you've added. Here's the enable brain button you've added. Those are the two things that will show up that weren't there before, okay? That's milestone three, just getting the GUI all hooked up, okay? Um, and just verifying, like when I click this button, the label changes, the instance variable gets set. When I choose the, the item in this combo box, the brain instance variable is updated to refer to the right brain, stuff like that. Milestone four, um, is a little bit more challenging. We're shifting from the graphical user interface stuff of this unit to more of an algorithm um, or, or more of like object-oriented inheritance stuff. So you're going to override the picks next piece method. Um, and you're going to figure out, you're going to use the brain if it's enabled to figure out where the next piece should go um, instead of like letting the user do it through the keyboard. You're gonna override the tick method. So every time tick down is called, which happens at regular intervals to move the piece down one row, um, you're instead gonna give the brain the opportunity to move the piece either left or right, and if it wants to, to rotate it, okay? Only move it one square left or right, right? The brain can't move it three squares to the left in one tick, right? You can only move one square left or right in a tick, and you can rotate it, so I can move it one square to the left and rotate it in one tick. That would be allowed. Um, and again, only do that if the brain is, is enabled. Um, you can just let the piece drift down. After you move it left or right and rotate it, you still got to call tick down, like on the super class, so it still moves down a row. So again, like I said, lots of calls to super in here. Um, then at milestone four, like it's gonna work. You can watch it play Tetris on its own. Sometimes between milestone three and four, things that were working get broken. So to help you with this, these bullet points are exactly the steps I follow when I test your lab. I do exactly these steps and make sure they all still work. So sometimes once we turn on the brain, we can't play the game manually anymore, which is not what we want. So like I make sure like that's what I test. Um, so when you're testing milestone four, do the same things I do when I test your program. Make sure all this stuff works, right? I go right through this list in order. Milestone five, you're not actually writing any new code. You might not notice that it's not quite working right in milestone four. So milestone five is a stress test where we set that special test um, argument when we run the main method. Um, and it runs a fixed sequence of 100 pieces. Um, it uses simple brain, um, and it should look exactly like this. Um, if you run the stress test and it looks exactly like this, that is such a good sign that you've implemented everything correctly. Um, so yeah, um, this is a great way to know you're in good shape. Once you've done that, there's so many other things you could do. Um, you could invent new Tetris pieces. That'd be fun, right? So you could add some new pieces to the game of Tetris, right? Um, and I give you some tips for that. Um, this one's really fun. You could actually add an adversary feature. Um, so you could add a, a little mode where 
you use a brain to pick the hardest piece to show up next. And then you let your friend play it. And it'll be the hardest game of Tetris they've ever played because every piece they get will be the worst possible piece for that board. Um, so that can be fun, like in a, in an evil way. So you could do that. Um, you could write your own big brain. That's a lot smarter. And I give you some tips here of ways that the algorithm could be improved. Um, that would be lots of ways here. So some students have written some really good big brain classes, um, or you could do something else. I've seen all sorts of things. So, but don't worry about the extensions till you finish all the milestones. So that's where we're headed this week.